appreciation for what we did, what we do. It means a lot to us, so thank you. Start that. Start with that. I first was here three years ago, and I sat right over there at the bar nursing a four-finger bottom shelf whiskey. <laughs> And I listened to my buddy, Pat Dixon, who's standing right over there, tell a story. Had to do with my brother, who was sitting right over there. And after I listened to him, I thought, God, I can do that. That's what I said about fishing. Nice thing about having the bar set low is it's just easy to step right over there. So how many of you have heard the term Bad decisions make for good stories. <laughs> well, I wrote a story about that. And uh, keep that in mind, because I hope it's a good story. I fished in Cook Inlet, like Will said, left the Kenai River about three in the morning one morning, dark. So it got out of the river and the sun started to come up, started to get a little bit light, and I saw the boats fanning out, going straight west. Started listening to the chatter on the radio and hear guys say, ah, I see a few jumpers up here. Looks like it might be pretty good. What do I do? I go south. What I'm thinking is the tide's flooding. Now in Cook Inlet, it is the biggest tidal change in the United States. From low tide to high tide can be 30 foot water change. So I'm thinking, if I go against, go against the flood and go, and, and go five miles down there or 10 miles down there, if the fish show up where these guys all are, I can still get back up there. So I do that. All I got to get is a few fish. I'm not going to fight all those guys up there. Besides, the northern boundary was up there. They could all get flooded over there and get pinched by the fishing game. So I get down there, run for another hour, another two hours maybe, I'm 10 miles away from the rest of the fleet. The radio chatter quiets down because it's 7 o'clock. It's time to set. Set my net out. Nothing. Not a cork bomb. And now the radio starts lighting up with the guys reporting what they've seen. Hey, I got a bunch of hits up here. Where you at? Oh, I'm up straight out from the river. I'm up there in the northern boundary. Shit. <laughs> so I pick up as fast as I can. Well, due to a slight miscalculation of reading the tide table wrong, which could be what you just said by why I was a captain at 17. I can't fight the tide, and I missed them. Missed them all day long. The average boat that day got 6,000 pounds of sockeye at $3 a pound. The highliners got 10,000. I scratched and clawed and maybe got 2,000 that day. Now, I beat myself up pretty good about that. But the only thing I could say was, seemed like a good idea <laughs> at the time. Now remember I was talking about the tide in Cook Inlet, the middle rip of Cook Inlet. When that tide's moving like that, can be a quarter mile wide and the waves can stand up like towers. And it's also a garbage dump. And the high tides take the sticks, the logs, the stumps, and everything off the beach and it almost ends up in that middle rip. But the fish are there, so sometimes you've got to go in there. I went in there and I thought, well, I'm just going to put out a third of the net because now I can control it. I can tow out of there if I get into trouble. I can get a few fish. I set out, and sure enough, there were a few fish. So what do I think? i got to get the whole net out, right? I look around. I don't see that much wood, so I thought, oh, this is going to work like a champ. Drop the buoy in the rip, set the whole thing out. We're talking 150 fathoms, 900 feet, three football fields, and I lay the whole thing straight out. I don't know where the wood came from. <laughs> but as soon as I got the net out, all, every stick, log, 
stump, I think, in the entire state of Alaska was in my neck. I have no choice but to run right into the rip, pick the buoy up, and try and clear it. The thing about clearing sticks out of the net is you can't throw them back in the water because they'll get right back in the net. You got to put them on deck. I spent all day long clearing that net. Hardly got any fish, but I had a nice beaver dam on my deck when I was done. And the only thing I can think about at the end of that day was it seemed like a good idea at the time. Went to fish the beach one day. A buddy of mine said, no, 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 don't go in there, there's rocks in there. I said, oh yeah, I know that. But the water smoothed them over. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so I do, drop the buoy, five feet of water right on the beach. Set the whole thing out this time, heck with it. I got a few hits, I'm going, man, I'm a smart guy. I'm a good fisherman. Bang, 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 they're hitting up and down the net. And then the net V's. The rock was here, my buoy was there, the boat was here, and it went like boom. And I went, ah. Oh. Well, that's no big deal. You just pick up along to get to the rock, power the boat around the rock, and you're free. You can set again. Well, that worked. It would have worked, except that. The reason that I got free was that the rock split my net right in half. So now the second half of it's going free down the beach. Well, then no big deal, right? I'm just going to go pick it up. Well, I hooked another rock, and now I'm a set netter. <laughs> got back in the river at the end of that day, and the buddy that told me not to go in there says, what were you thinking? I said, seemed like a good idea at the time. Good buddy of mine had the hots for a girl, fished on another boat. Problem was that we were fishing every single day. And we were in this three mile wide area right against the east shore called the east side corridor. Fish and Game did that so that we couldn't get out in the middle where the fish were. I'd say every day we were getting 15, 20, maybe on a good day, 30 fish. Not even paying your expenses. So day after day we're doing this, and my buddy is just day after day, he can't make his move. So he decides, yeah, I'm going to have a barbecue. So he calls everybody up for a barbecue. We didn't care about whether we showed up or not, but he got her to show up. So we're sitting there, and another buddy of mine, and we sit there talking, and he says, you know what? If we get out of the river real early tomorrow morning, maybe the fresh ocean fish are gonna come in, and we can be the first ones in line. I said, that's a great idea. Tell the buddy who's Lance Romance, <laughs> hey, here's what we're gonna do. He looks at us, looks at the girl, Looks back at us, looks back at the girl, and he goes, no, nah. you guys, good luck getting your 20 fish. So we leave early the next morning. We're way down there, 30 miles, I set out, now the sun's coming up on the east. I set out from east to west, so I can't see much of the net, but the part I can see, I'm seeing some nice hits. I pick up after an hour, I had 500 sockeye six pounds of fish, 3,000 pounds, $3 a pound. I just made $9,000. Set out again, I got another 500. Set out a third time, I got 500. I got $27,000 worth of fish in the hold. I had time for one more set. Right at the end of the day, I got another 100. Almost a $30,000 day. That was a happy run back. Get back on the river, offload the fish, wash up the boat, tie up to the dock, and here comes Lance. <laughs> Chest all puffed out, comes down to my boat, and he's sitting there just begging me to ask him how it went. <laughs> and I was polite. I asked him, I 
had to listen to it. And then he goes, so how'd you do? He didn't know. I go, not bad. He goes, what do you mean, not bad? You get 50? No, no, I, I didn't get 50. Oh, thank God, if you got 50, he said, I'm just shit. <laughs> What do you do? I saved him the suspense. I said, hey, I got to tell you the truth. I got 1,600. I don't know where his mind went, but the color drained completely out of his face. And he stood up, walked up the two steps, out of my cabin, up onto the deck. And he turned around, looked back in the cabin at me, and he said, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I, uh, I dated a dancer from the local strip club one summer. <laughs> That didn't work out so well, but <laughs> thank you. We had a couple really, really good seasons. We made a lot of money one year, or two over uh, two straight years, in fact. And uh, the local uh, amateur pharmacist. <laughs> Uh, anyone who's fished here knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, in a fish camp, you can't go anywhere, so he'd take a personal check, right? And I'm thinking, well, okay, this is kind of like fishing supplies. <laughs> so I wrote it off on my taxes. <laughs> when the IRS agent asked me what I was thinking, I said, see, you know, like a good idea. <laughs> 1989, uh, <laughs> the Exxon uh, oil spill occurred. I was expecting the birth of my uh, oldest daughter, and I decided to sell my boats. I sold my salmon boat, sold my, ha sam or my halibut boat. And if you'd ask me, do I regret it? Do I miss it? The only thing I can tell you because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Thank you very much.